Hi, I'm Ken Johnson. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and today we're going to talk about creating terrarium ornaments. Terrarium ornaments are a great way to add some living decor to your home. They're also easy to make and a great way to include some kids in a craft project. To make a terrarium ornament, there's a few basic supplies you're going to need. Obviously, you'll need some sort of ornament. You can use plastic ornaments like this that can be snapped together, kind of like a clamshell. They also make ornaments that are specifically made for creating terrariums, and you can see they have these large holes in them. They come in plastic as well as glass, and there are also some of these terrarium ornaments that can be hooked together to create a chain. Next, you'll need to decide what type of plants you want to use. Some popular plants for creating terrarium ornaments include succulents like sedums or hens and chicks. Air plants are also quite popular, and you can also use something like moss. The types of plants you choose are going to play a role in what type of growing media you'll use when creating your terrarium ornament. If you're using succulents or some other sort of rooted plant, you want to use potting mix, and getting some activated charcoal may also be a good idea. If you're using air plants, you can use sand or small gravel to place your plants in, and if you're using moss, you can use soil or whatever that moss was growing on. You may also want to look for some decor to include in your terrarium ornament, such as rocks, or sticks or bark. You can also use any kind of knickknacks laying around the house or look at for these in a craft store. You'll also want to get some string that you can use to hang your ornament with. And depending on the type of ornament you use, you may need to get some tape. A mister and tweezers can also be used, but they are not necessary to put together a terrarium ornament. The first terrarium we'll make, we're going to be using moss. You can find moss outdoors in shady areas of your landscape or if you don't have any moss in your yard or you don't have a yard, it can also be purchased. If there are stores in your area that sell terrarium supplies, they may have moss, or there are also several companies online that will sell it. If you have a plastic clamshell-like ornament like this that's going to snap together, um, this is probably the best choice because moss is going to thrive in moist environments. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a scoop of this activated charcoal in the bottom of that ornament. And this is just going to kind of help collect some of that excess moisture that may be in the soil. Next, I'm going to take some of this moss that I found in my backyard. I'm going to put this into my ornament and kind of gently pack that down in there like this. Next, I can add any sort of trinkets or decor that I want. So I've, I've gone and collected some rocks in my backyard. So I will just stick these in there. And I also decided I'm going to use this little kind of evergreen Christmas tree uh, type ornament here. I'll stick that down in my moss. So then when I'm happy with that, I'll go ahead and put this ornament back together. And if you're using an ornament like this that's going to snap together, you want to try to put these little eye eyelets on either side of the ornament. That's going to hold best. And you can see uh, on this ornament, this side right here is on the top. So this is the side I'm going to want to tape in order to really hold this ornament together well so it doesn't fall apart when I go and hang it. So I'm just going to put a little tape on either side of this hook. So once I've got my tape on there, our ornament is ready to hang. Next we'll make a succulent terrarium ornament. So succulents can be found in many different nurseries and garden centers as well as a variety of places online. Since succulents like drier conditions, an ornament that's got an open front like this is probably going to be the best option. So again, just like our moss, I'm going to put some of this activated charcoal down at the bottom. And again, this is going to um, kind of hold on to some of that excess moisture that may be in there so our growing media doesn't get too wet. Next, I'm going to put in that growing media. And in this case, I've got some potting mix um, that's kind of specifically made for cactus or other succulents and this has got a little more sand in it it's a little bit looser so it's not going to retain quite as much water and fortunately succulents are fairly shallow rooted so we don't have to worry about having a tremendous amount of potting mix in here and it's also going to be important to make sure you don't get too much so that it doesn't start spilling out of the opening here once we have our mix in there we can start adding our decor and you want to start working from the back to the front. So I'm going to put some rocks in here again that I found uh, in my yard. And if you have fat fingers like I do, this is where the tweezers may come in handy. So I've got some rocks 
in there. I'm going to take some of my succulents here. I'm just going to make a little indentation there, stick my plants in there, and then kind of firm up that soil around those. And as those roots start growing, will kind of anchor themselves uh, much better into this mix. And these are kind of on the small end. Um, you can use much larger succulents in there. And I'm going to put one of my little snowmen in here. I should have put this in earlier, but better late than never. And since I'm going to go with a little bit of a, a winter theme here, I'm going to take some of this sand that I have, and I'm going to sprinkle that over our potting mix, kind of make it look like it has snowed. So I'll do another scoop in here. And then when you're happy with the way that looks, you can go ahead and put your string on your ornament. And then it will be ready to hang. The last terrarium ornament we'll put together, we're going to use air plants. Air plants, like these other plants we've used, can be found in many different nurseries and garden centers, often lumped in with the cacti, as well as a variety of different places online. Air plants grow as epiphytes, so they don't need any soil to grow in. Instead of using the roots to take up nutrients, they use their roots to attach to plants and other rocky substrates. So for this ornament, I am going to use some sand as our kind of our growing media. This is basically just going to hold the, these air plants in place. And then when we're happy with the amount we have in there, again, we can add in any decor we may want, again, working from the back to the front. So here I've got my air plant. I'm going to stick that in there. And again, I'm going to kind of twist that down into the sand so it's anchored in there fairly well. And then we'll add this little bird in there as some additional decor, and there we have our air plant terrarium ornament. So here we have the three ornaments we've made. We'll go through real quickly how to care for these. First for our moss ornament, again, moss likes moist conditions. That's why we use this ornament that seals up. So hopefully we won't need to add any additional water to that. Moss thrives in kind of shady conditions, so indirect light is going to be best for these types of ornaments. For our succulents, succulents are going to like bright sunny conditions. So if you don't have those types of conditions in your house, you may need to use some supplemental or artificial lighting for these plants. Again, they also like dry conditions. That's why we use this ornament with the open front. So make sure that growing media dries out in between waterings. For our air plants, these are going to do best with bright indirect light, preferably with an east or west facing window. There's a couple of different ways we can water these. First, we can mist these probably every other day, especially if you have a house with low humidity. You can also take these plants out of their ornaments, put them under running water a couple times a week, and dry those off and put them back into your ornament. Or you can take them out once a week, submerge them in water for about 20 minutes to an hour, again, letting them dry off before you put them back into your ornament. So once you're done with your ornaments, you can hang them from your tree, but this isn't the only way you can use them. You can give them as gifts, you can use them as a centerpiece, put them on the mantle, especially if you have one of these flat bottom ornaments, you can also hang them from a hook in the ceiling and enjoy them throughout the year. Thanks for watching and keep on growing. Hello everyone and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists and our special guests here to answer your gardening questions and talk about all things gardening that's happening this time of year. So my name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist for Illinois Extension and I'm based here in Bloomington and I love to chat about all things flowers. So I'm going to talk about kind of local flowers for Thanksgiving today. Um, but luckily we also have some other experts with us today who love to chat about other gardening topics and other horticulture topics. So uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves next. Kelly, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Kelly Alsup, and I do love plants, of course, but I also love talking about insects, the good ones, the bad ones, the invasive ones, <laughs> the, the ones that invade your house. I really like, enjoy talking about them, so feel free to stump me. Um, hmm. 
which I do get stumped a lot. Usually, uh, usually I can, I'm good at saying, Hey, that's an insect. And that is my professional <laughs> opinion. Um, so there you go. That's me. <laughs> and I'm Ryan Panko, horticulture educator out of Champaign. And my specialty is definitely trees and shrubs, you know, woody plants, but also a big native plant lover and a big uh, grow your own vegetable gardener kind of person. And so along those lines, we have a, a bit of a local foods aficionado on our call today. So Nick, would you mind introducing yourself to folks? Yep. Thanks for that intro, Ryan. Um, hey folks, I'm Nick Frillman. I am the local food systems and small farms educator serving McLean, Livingston, and Woodford County based in Bloomington here. Same office as Kelly. Um, so definitely can vouch for her all things bug comment. Um, <laughs> really has a, a cool collection of interesting insects in her office. And uh, yeah, speaking of local foods today, we'd love to, uh, uh, we're going to pick each other's brains here on the topic of uh, buying local foods for your special meal this Thanksgiving and why it's important and why you should consider doing it, what that all entails. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Nick. We're happy to have you here. So everybody watching, if you have um, questions related to our topic today of kind of talking about a local Thanksgiving feel free to add those to the comment box or if you have lingering gardening questions too as the season's coming to a close, we're happy to answer those today as well. But yeah, I think we're going to kick off our conversation, Nick, with first off kind of talking about well, what exactly is a local Thanksgiving. When we say the term local, what are we, what are we kind of talking about there? Yeah, yeah, great question. And um, the team, the local foods team, I imagine uh, in every person that's part of the team fields this question quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But how I like to think about it is, um, you know, uh, the concept of, I don't know if folks have heard about the concept of a food shed before. Um, it's a little out there. Um, some folks may not have heard of it, but just like we think about a watershed being all tiny sources of uh, you know, creeks and streams that eventually lead to a specific river. Um, so say the Mackinac, um, which is the one closest to us here. You have lots of little creeks and streams that feed in there, and we call the Mackinac River watershed everything that feeds into that uh, source of water for the area. So if we think about a food shed, for example, around Chicago um, or Bloomington Normal, you would think of all the local producers and suppliers that supply those bigger geographical areas. So Bloomington Normal and the greater Bloomington Normal area may be supplied as far away as uh, folks near St. Louis, all the way up to the north border of Illinois. Um, so it's kind of broad, kind of all encompassing. Um, that's one side of it. Another way I like to think about it is just um, if you live in one place and you're familiar with the farm that, you know, works uh, nearby and provides folks that live there with food, uh, consider them local. But that's very much so a, a working definition. And uh, this concept gets talked about a lot. I'd be interested mm -hmm. to hear what my colleagues have to say. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of different definitions of local. And, and some folks argue that, I mean, it's kind of like native, you know, how native is yeah. native? Mm -hmm. You know, how close yeah. do you want to get? I mean, I, I tend to agree with you, Nick, that it's kind of like from those larger metropolitan areas and within the state, you know, down to St. Louis, up to Chicago area. I feel like that's kind of all our local food. Because uh, when you think about um, a lot of stuff we buy at the grocery store, man, it's thousands of miles that mm -hmm. it travels to get here. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of compared to your typical produce item you pick up, I'm thinking in terms of plants too, where mm -hmm. there's tons of other things that are local too, not just plants. Yeah, maybe uh -huh. we can, uh, maybe maybe we could agree thus far on a definition of from Illinois or maybe uh -huh. from the Midwest that starts to stretch it a little bit for me because the Midwest is big, but maybe, you know, just our state border, especially since we are so close to uh, the center of it, at least myself, Ryan and, uh, and Kelly Candace as well. I don't know where, uh, where our moderators based, but anyway, different, different story. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, so our so, unit has taken this, kind of local Thanksgiving and kind of made it into a challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, a, Nick and then our nutrition educator also worked on the project with Nick and I. And it had been something that I had been doing for a while because I wanted to promote our local farmers markets. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted people to go because the farmers markets the big ones especially tend to have that Saturday market 
right before Thanksgiving, and I wanted people to go and get those vegetables. But, you know, and then it was like, well, what is local? And so Jenna, oh, she came out with a really great explanation. So this is what she thinks as a nutrition educator, what local is. Okay. She says, locally grown food isn't shipped thousands of miles. It reduces the carbon footprint, supports our local farmers, and offers tastier, more nutritious food. When food doesn't have to travel far, it can be picked ripe, eaten soon after harvest, retaining more nutrients and flavor than food picked unripe and stored for a longer period of time. So, uh, you know, yeah, really he described local from the food aspect. I'm describing local from the I want to support my local farming neighbors, the ones uh -huh. that have, you know, who are growing all the beautiful squashes and beets and all that stuff that I want to have on my Thanksgiving table. And she was talking about how local Thanksgiving to her means tastier and more nutritious meal. And so uh, I thought it was just kind of a cool way, the way the three different people involved look at what this question is. For Kelly, it was all, all about farmer's markets. For Nick, it's, you know, it's this, you know, kind of concept that people, you know, even in his field, can't really, you know, Des, uh, describe and then for her it was oh um if you go out and get this food you're going to have a more nutritious thanksgiving meal and she wants you to have a more nutritious thanksgiving meal right She'd much rather yeah. eat squash than eat you know green beans in a can or yeah can something from who knows where yeah yeah i think there's one other little tidbit in there kelly didn't she talk about carbon footprint Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that that's really a reason why, I mean, years ago, I, my, my wife and I got inter really interested in local foods from that aspect of just, you know, not trucking something for a thousand miles across the country or, um, you know, something interesting that came up just a few weeks ago, we had our East Central Illinois Master Naturalist annual meeting and the state climatologist gave an pr awesome presentation about you know, climate change as it, as it relates to water resources in Illinois and kind of ended it with like, what are some things you can do? And one of the things that he mentioned was support, you know, local agricultural production. And, you know, beyond just that carbon footprint thing, one thing he pointed out I thought was super interesting is just the fact that, you know, a lot of um, that stuff that ships from a thousand miles away comes from drier climates that are going to be more susceptible to climate change than our Midwestern climate. We're kind of lucky where we sit that that warming isn't going to be as, as much of an impact for us as it is in a place like, say, the Central Valley of California. And so if we can start to, you know, build a better just local food system now, we are going to be more resilient and, and more adaptable to climate change down the road as some of those other production areas are experiencing this. So Nick, is that something you guys talk about at all? I, I had never even thought about that until I heard that um, just last week. Yeah, yeah we we definitely we definitely think about that, and that's I think why I was uh, so focused on uh, in my write up that I collaborated on with uh, with Kelly and Jenna. Um, I was focused on particularly the livestock as well as uh, um, just the seasonality of produce. And uh, the last time I was on this show, we talked about cool season crops. That was back in spring. So we're doing it again now. It's at, it's at mm -hmm. towards the end of fall. Um, I'll start with the crops first. But uh, yeah, um, my wife and I, uh, Emily, have been have been talking about um, being okay with the seasonality of food in our house. So mm -hmm. right now on the counter, we have butternut squash and kabocha squash and spaghetti squash. It's the winter squash <laughs> season, of course. And mm -hmm. some people, and I see some in Kelly's background right there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and they're super good and very versatile and lots of things can be done with them. That's not everybody's cup of tea though. There's also beets, carrots, root vegetables, storage crops. And so just being okay with, you know, you're not, maybe it's not a great idea to get a tomato right now because it's going to taste a little watery and it's not going to be super sweet because it's coming from California and there's not anything wrong with farmers out there trying to make a living. And if, uh, you know, stores around us are going to buy them hats off to them. 
for, you know, win, winning business proposition. But in terms of the carbon footprint, it's definitely not the most environmentally friendly thing to do. Uh, what would be friendly is um, environmentally friendly is going down to uh, the Grossinger Motors Arena this coming Saturday from uh, nine to noon and supporting the uh, local Bloomington Normal area, uh, small producers, farmers, craft makers, et cetera, um, because they're making stuff all in town. The carbon footprint will be you getting to that location, whether or not you choose to drive or walk. We luckily live close enough to walk, you know, it's 15 minutes. So that's a privilege we have, but uh, at least that's a couple miles in your car instead of, uh, you know, a thousand miles or 2000 from the, from the central Valley and back. So. And yeah, Nick, I know that you and your wife are part of a CSA and Ryan mm -hmm. does a lot of his own vegetable gardening. I do a little mm -hmm. bit, but I'm, I'm a farmer's market groupie, and so is Candace. We're definitely mm -hmm. farmer's market groupies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I ha when I've walked into past um, farmer's markets before the holiday, I have been floored at some of the things that I've been able to find, like really delicious apples or Brussels sprouts on the stem or mm -hmm. um, garlic and onions and all of these little things little additions that are going to make my meal just that extra level where I don't have to be the perfect cook. <laughs> right. I have awesome ingredients. That yeah. Are really good. Awesome flavors added in. Yeah. And yep. another thing is I love like, um, um, buying, uh, you know, other local ingredients there. I'll find honey and cheeses and um, these cottage food types of items. Jams, popcorns. Yes. Mm -hmm. It just take the meal to the next level as mm -hmm. far as taste. And, you know, it's not just this average Thanksgiving meal. I mean, for me, it's a vegetarian meal because that's my family. Hmm. So we don't add the turkey. No offense, Ryan and Nick. I'm not a, opposed to turkey. But the, those vegetables really highlight. So mm -hmm. walking in there, seeing all those beautiful, fresh vegetables, and then bringing them to my sister, who's the cook. <laughs> and, you know, it just, you know, I just can't imagine Thanksgiving before. I mean, how what yeah. we before, like... Now we're like, oh, we're going to have roasted beets and we're going to have Brussels sprouts and we're going to have squash soup and, mm -hmm. you know, sweet potatoes and pumpkins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You bring up a good point. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't really need to be a good cook or I mean, you can be an average cook. And if you have amazing quality mm -hmm. ingredients and, you know, that kind of speaks for yeah. they, they speak for themselves. Um, and, you know, they may not be the cheapest ingredients. But uh, you'll definitely know where your money went when you, you know, purchase anything out there. And something that I've seen in the last uh, year and a half, two years, uh, both at a, another job in Oregon last year and then since coming back is uh, all the farmers markets that I've been at are now taking uh, SNAP tokens. So you can go there with your mm -hmm. SNAP card if you're a low income citizen of the area. Um, and you can go to the informational tent usually and you swipe your card and you'll tell them how much, you know, how many tokens you want. And you shop with these wooden tokens or plastic or paper or what have you um, that you can use in place of cash with the vendors. And the vendors are still getting paid at the end of the day. They're exchanging those tokens for cash. And um, last time I was at the Urbana market, it was a special uh, two times matching day where I was seeing folks, if they paid 25 bucks of SNAP, they were getting 50 tokens. So mm -hmm. I don't know if Bloomington is doing that. I can't mm -hmm. speak to that for sure. Oh, Thank Candace you. is saying, well, are they doing like two for three for a day sometimes? Yeah, I can't remember if it's a specific day or a period, but they've done that in the past for sure. Yeah, but they're at least, but you can at least use your, your SNAP benefits mm -hmm. at the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. So it won't, you know, stretch your food at like bill as long. But uh, if you want to go and you don't feel like you can with, you know, your out-of-pocket money, then uh, that's another option. Cool. And it could be a way to make the meal extra special. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So we've had a good question that kind of relates to, um, you were talking earlier, Nick, about kind of being comfortable with eating a seasonal diet, essentially, mm -hmm. during these times of year. So Lisa asked a question, 
um, has the current weather weather patterns made a difference in crop production? Because I think that's something someone who is switching maybe to shopping more locally has to kind of keep in mind that there's going to be changes in weather. There's going to be challenges for the farmers that might make certain things unavailable that might have been available in a previous year type of um, thing like that. So do you want to maybe chat about that a little bit earlier, a little bit? Yeah, um, great question. Um, and definitely something that we're going to have to keep in mind, especially as, uh, you know, uh, climate change gets generally worse for some areas of the country, a um, little bit worse for others, including ourselves. I think we're supposed to get wetter, if I remember correctly. And maybe Ryan can, can from the climatologist guy, can confirm that. Yeah. So I think Illinois is supposed to get a decent bit wetter as we go forward. Um, right now, um, I don't believe that any seasonal produce that's normally available now is unavailable. Um, I think that uh, if folks were hoping to get tomatoes and uh, bell peppers and stuff at the at the market this uh, Saturday, that you'll be out of luck there because we've had several freezes. Peppers yeah. can last a really long time on the plant. Like I've had plants that, uh, you know, I've neglected and I go back and find peppers on the plant that are six, seven weeks old. So they'll hang on for a while. But as soon as they get a frost, they get squishy after a couple days. And so... If you're looking for those things, they won't be there. But in the way of like sweet potatoes, potatoes, onions, garlic, uh, any type of winter squash, um, no, I'm I'm not remembering any significant recent weather event. Maybe Kelly and uh, Ryan, if you do, you can pipe in. But um, I think that that was a concern in June and July this year when we had all that rain after Mother's Day weekend, a lot of people's uh, fields were flooded, including uh, the CSA uh, farmer that I support, Cook Farms in town. Um, their fields were just completely flooded. And so definitely uh, location of farms and the risk that they take on is a big burden that they're willing to bear uh, for us, the consumer. So we have to find out ways to uh, continue to support them. Otherwise, they you know, won't be in business, uh, not, not Dylan's farm, but just small farmers in general, that's a hard life to start out with and then add climate events on top of it. So that being said, get out there and support them because these crops are looking good. Uh, we had a good, good dry year uh, at the end there. And I think it really helped out. She awesome. might be referring to that article that just came out about, um, pumpkins may not be a viable crop for Southern Illinois because it keeps getting drier mm. or it keeps okay. getting wetter, excuse me. Mm. <laughs> right, because, you know, wetter, more humid environment means a lot of diseases for pumpkin plants. And yes. so um, yep. that it, it just came out, I think it just came, I don't know why it why I was triggered by that in late October, they were talking mm -hmm. about how, um, you know, Southern Illinois University was think it was trying to maybe think about breeding different pumpkin varieties to grow in uh, Southern Illinois um, because um, the weather is, uh, you know, like too hot in the summer. And then uh -huh. you get that combination of the moist weather. Hot I feel like yeah. the moist weather affected my personal gardening a lot more than the temperature because I mean things were kept too wet. I couldn't get things germinated, and mm -hmm. then I was getting disease issues. Mm -hmm. Ryan, what did uh, what did the climatologist say about Southern Illinois? Or, uh, or you know, our, I don't know if. I don't know if he really, he was more generalizing the, the whole state as a whole. Okay. But yeah, definitely we're already seeing that increase in rainfall. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we he talks some about um, just some recent like massive storm events that have happened, you know, where uh, here locally Gibson City had, was massively flooded uh -huh. by 10 inches of rain in two hours. I, I mean, I'm totally making up numbers there. I can't remember exactly, but it's about uh, a day. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're seeing um, not only more rainfall in total per year, but mm -hmm. like larger storms like that, that, um, you know, beyond just farming and plant growth and all those kind of things that puts a stress on just the infrastructure that handles floodwater, you know, where, um, you know, things were designed for what we thought was a 10 year storm, you know, 20 years ago, that's being redefined, you know, and that's, 
you know, that's the probability that every 10 years you'll have a storm this size. Mm -hmm. As we get more rainfall, you know, that's a bigger storm that we would see every 10 years. And so I think they characterize that Gibson City storm as a one in 500 year storm or something. That, mm -hmm. and then, uh, one really neat thing, I don't have the, I can maybe grab the link for this, but the State Water Survey did a really cool uh, story map of how that flood happened. It shows the water, you know, rising over time and kind of filling the the map. It's kind of just an aerial view of Gibson City. So just kind of neat to um, understand. I mean, a little scary too to understand, you know, mm -hmm. like, like you talked about, Nick, the flooding that impacts farming. That could be a bigger deal because all those drainage dishes, all those tiles, other things are just not designed for the size storms we can expect in the future. So that's, that's going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a conversation that's going to be coming up a lot. <laughs> yeah, I hope we answered uh, Lisa's question. So yeah, kind thanks of for the question. Oh. Yeah, okay. thanks for the question, Lisa. And if you, if anybody has other questions related to local Thanksgiving or other gardening stuff, we're happy to touch on them. Great conversation so far. Sorry, Kelly, what were you going to say? It does lead to another point that pumpkins are most likely produced here in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And if you go out and buy pumpkins, you're most likely supporting a Illinois farmer. Even if you buy a can um, of pumpkins, you're, um, mo you know, between um, 80 and 95 percent chance you're probably supporting um, an Illinois farmer, which is why growing pumpkins is making the news in this state. Um, so... We grow, you know, even the, the ornamental kinds, the pie kind, um, the more white, they grew a lot more white pumpkins last year. Um, another one that I think is a trendy. Really, huh? I said white pumpkins are trendy. Cool. Another one that I, that I think is really cool is the knucklehead. Mm -hmm. Those are cool. And then the flat stackers. So, um, you know, even if you can't make a farmer's market or um, what well, we're going to talk about turkey soon, because we know that's important. <laughs> you can still, you know, buy some ornamental pumpkins for to decorate for the family or the table or however. Eat them. Yeah. Eat them. Not, not, eat the them. Ornament, not the ornamentals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah eat, eat the pie kind. Yeah. yeah, I think it's always funny when we we see that that can of canned pumpkin at the grocery store and it's got that bright orange jack-o'-lantern type mm -hmm. pumpkin on it. And I think most people don't realize that the processing pumpkin that's actually in the can looks nothing like that. It's not a bright orange uh, pumpkin at all. Can we can we pull up? Anybody got a picture of one of those pumpkins that we could share? I don't, um, but I don't but I saw I rows either. and rows of them in the field a couple weeks mm -hmm. ago when I was driving around at some yeah. at some farms, and uh, I didn't take a picture. Yeah, uh, they were light though, right? Like light, light. Yeah, really light colored. Yeah, kind of oddly shaped. Mm -hmm. Not jack o' lantern mm -hmm. shaped. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> anyway, very cool. cool. Right. Well, let's let's talk about turkeys. We kind of touched on kind of like what vegetables you might see when you head to the farmer's market, but I know Ryan's been doing some cool stuff with a turkey this year. Ryan, you want to kind of tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. We um, Well, we have a turkey walking around in our barnyard right now that is going to be Thanksgiving, unfortunately. He, he doesn't know that yet, but um, <laughs> it's not the first time we've raised uh, turkeys before. We've, you know, I mean, it's it's been... You know, years ago now that we got into a lot of this local food stuff, that's what's made me the vegetable gardener that, that I am now, that I wanted to, you know, I was really focused on growing a lot of my own stuff over the years. And so we've always had, I mean, I think chickens were kind of the first livestock we ever got. And then, you know, in, in maybe the last 10 years, we've got turkeys several times. We don't do it every year, but... Um, but yeah, we've got a turkey walking around that um, will um, actually, uh, my wife's cousin's husband will actually be smoking for Thanksgiving for a bunch of us. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I'm excited about, uh, I'm, I'm just really nervous though, as we're getting down to these last days here, that some type of predator is going to find my turkey before, <laughs> before we get to eat them ourselves. Um, well, yeah, because you said you started with more than just one, right? Yeah, we started with actually four little turkeys, you know, as um, with with some chicks that we also got, uh, you know, just chickens. 
um, that you can, you know, nowadays you can go to lots of the ag farm stores and just that they have bins and bins of chickens where it used to be, they used to be harder to track down and it wasn't, you know, all summer long that they had those, you, you had to either get there for that one little window in the spring or um, believe it or not, you can actually have them shipped to your house. Mm -hmm. we've, we've done that before to get different kinds, but um, yeah. But yeah, we started with four, and unfortunately, like when they were young, smaller, um, something got into our chicken coops and, you know, killed some of them one night. So we we were lucky one turkey survived, and some of those chicks did that now have all kind of grown up, and that's, but that's, to me, I mean, it, it's kind of part of having chickens, you know, is, is that... I mean, it, it, it goes all the way back to like Looney Tunes as a kid, you know, the predator versus the chickens and the chicken. I mean, I think back to all that. It's like, gosh, that is really kind of a real life thing, you know. Um, so it's it's just that constant, you know, de defending your chickens from uh, things that are trying to get into the coop. And, and, you know, the best best advice I can give anyone is just have a way to secure your coop at night, which we do have like a door that we shut every night on our coop. But unfortunately, our turkey has gotten too big to fit in that door. So now, <laughs> so now he goes and roosts wherever he wants, and I've got to go find him and carry him into the coop and put him in each night. So I'm just worried I'm not going to get out there soon enough one of these nights. And, but, um, <laughs> so, yeah, Eric, kind of Aaron, and Aaron had a good question I was going to ask you too. She asked, Ryan, have you talked to your kids about the turkey and that's been wandering around the property? Maybe they already kind of understand what's going on but has it been, it been a learning uh moment for them too i would assume yeah it has process. i mean this you know this is not the first animal um that's went through this process on our farm and I, I think that is um you know really valuable lesson to learn and where your food comes from and, mm -hmm. and you know like so many of us just pick up a con container of meat in the grocery store you don't even think about it. You're, you're detached from all this other process all the care that animal takes up to the point that it is turned into this edible product and um so yeah i i think that's why my wife and i made the choice to kind of have these animals around is just so our children can kind of learn about you know the, the really what's going on here in the real world um and you know at, at one point we uh mostly ate all meat that we produced whether I used to be a lot more of an actual of a hunter. You know, it's something that being in the wildlife forestry field, um, I got inter very interested in college. I hadn't done it when I was younger. And um, and so between things we hunted, things we raised, we mostly produced all of our own meat, where in recent years here, we've started to kind of buy, purchase more things because there are local producers that we feel like are more sustainably producing that meat. And um, you know, there's more choices in, in the meat you can buy. And we feel like if we don't support some of those choices, that's also another bad thing. You know, if you're not supporting that local producer. So, I mean, mm -hmm. just I know locally right around us, there is a local turkey farm that you can purchase your Thanksgiving turkey from. And actually, I didn't realize this until recently, they will cook it for you too. They'll deliver oh, to you a nice. cooked turkey. And it costs more, obviously, to have it sure. cooked, but... Gosh, what a great option. So, uh, save time. Nick, if I don't want to have to carry my turkey into the coop every night, <laughs> but I'd like to have a fresh local turkey for Thanksgiving, what do I do? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think um, I would love to raise turkeys, just like one, just a couple like Ryan mm -hmm. did. Um, my my wife and I rent a house and uh it's in Bloomington, and I don't think that I'm allowed to have mm -mm. Uh, turkeys in the yard. I think I could have a chicken coop if I paid a big permitting fee. So that's down the road. You know, maybe a couple of years we'll move out of town. But um, yeah, if you would like to go down the local turkey road this Thanksgiving, it might not be too late. Although in the next couple of days here, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be crunch time. So what I did when I wrote part of this press release for this local Thanksgiving that we were on is I literally Googled local turkeys, central Illinois. And I just did that. Um, and what pops up here um, is uh, here we go. Let me uh, share my screen really quick. If that's okay with everybody. And uh, yeah, there we go. All right. All right. So you should be able to see my screen now. Can y'all? Yep. All right, so this is what I did, local turkey, central Illinois. And right away, a couple of uh, 
Google Maps uh, names came up. These may be like people that these may be farms that are like paying Google to feature them. Um, so I kind of like to give everybody a fair shot. So I'll go down to the next couple sources here. And uh, so I clicked this one to write the article and you'll notice it's a couple years old, but it says 13 turkey farms where you can purchase a Thanksgiving turkey in central Illinois. And I actually went down this whole list. Uh, when I was writing um, the article and I checked and uh, some of them unfortunately are out of business, but uh, there are a few that, that are not. So if I can switch over to this one right here, let's see if I can uh, share a different screen. I don't know if I can or not. I'm going to have to stop sharing and then share again. Microsoft Word. So could Candace also could they could a person um, connect to the local farmers market? Would the locals farmers market know how to know where some of these places are? Yeah, I would say most of your most of them should. So and most of them have a way to get in touch, whether it's an email or you could send them a Facebook message, kind of reach out. A lot of them are going to post kind of what's coming to the market too. So a lot of them will post a menu of kind of what all of the the farms are going to bring. But yeah, if you're not kind of finding anything through a Google search of your your area, find your closest farmers market, and yeah, I would say reach out to them, and they most of the, I would say most of the time would have a good connection for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, they're usually, the farming community is really connected. So if mm -hmm. they don't know, then they probably know someone who knows. And yep, uh, exactly. yeah, I, I found four or five and I featured four of them in our write-up. And actually, if folks want to go to the article, it was, it, if you go into the chat and you scroll all the way back up to the top of the chat. Nick, um, well, she'll add it to the thing. Yeah, yeah great. We'll, awesome. we'll get it added, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can see some names uh, in that article. And um yeah, if uh, if you do one or two of them are actually featured on um, Market Wagon, which is this really cool um, delivery service. Um, yeah, Local Foods Delivery Service that I just learned about this year. I guess it's been around since pre-COVID, but it got really big thanks to COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some turkey farmers that will actually uh, kill their turkeys and never freeze them and deliver them fresh to your doorstep the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. That's what I opted for. And I will tell everybody off the bat to be fully transparent. It's a lot more expensive than, you know, 30, 40 cents a pound at the grocery store. But let me read you this one paragraph from my write up here um, and give everybody like an idea of why it might be that much more. So uh, let it be known that four to six dollars a pound, um, about half the cost of a decent steak is the average cost of these birds. And this may not be doable for everybody and that's okay, but it's been a difficult year for many and it may have well, may well have been a tougher than average year for the reader, but the same goes for our farmers. So anybody with meat animals of any kind had to navigate processors who charged more money. They switched to weird or inconvenient hours. And some of them just plain closed up shop, uh, just threw up their hands and said they didn't want to do it anymore. They also had to contend, the, the farmers this is, had to contend with higher feed bills, longer shipping times for everything that they needed on the farm and more. So if you can afford four to six dollars a pound, you might want to consider supporting those people because it was a hard fought year for them and you'll taste the difference immediately for yourself. If you can't and you don't want to or you're vegetarian, then there's all the vegetables for you that you could want. So anyway, just my two cents. It was a difficult year for farmers, especially livestock folks. Good points, definitely. Yeah, and it w it won't be the you know won't be the cheapest meal of the year, but it'll be super special if you go this route. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do all of the steps to taking the local um, Thanksgiving challenge. Some you can do one or two things, or right. you could even go out and buy some local honey mm -hmm. and support a beekeeper. Um, and we know we, we love the bees. We know we love the beekeepers. The honey it can be a delicious additive to any meal. I'm not sure Jenna would say it was more nutritious. Mm. <laughs> still a sweetener, right? But at it's least still it's, sugar. It's a local sweetener. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> nice. Cool. So we've hit on some of the vegetables. We've hit on some of the meats. I want to touch on flowers because mm -hmm. that's probably one thing that 
probably hasn't kind of popped into your mind when you're talking about a, a local Thanksgiving. So obviously there's one aspect of purchasing flowers from a local florist, which is uh, amazing to start with. The second step then to that would be even better would be to purchase local flowers mm -hmm. from a local flower producer. So mm -hmm. we talked about carbon footprint earlier and the same goes for flowers. The majority, uh, over 80% of the flowers we use in the United States for floral design come from outside the U.S., Ecuador, Colombia, warmer climates, of course, like tomatoes and things we talked about earlier. So obviously there's also a big movement in the U.S. for slow flowers and locally grown um, flowers. So that's another thing you can look for when you head to the farmer's market or you head to your local grocery store is to look for some of that signage that will tell you that there's a American grown flowers campaign, which you is a lot of times you can find in the grocery store. That's a great thing. Uh, but then of course, when you go to the farmer's market, you may be able to find some local flower producers that you can purchase from. So I grabbed a couple of things that I'm going to kind of show you here quick, and then we can kind of chat through other stuff while I'm, while I'm gathering. Let me push this down here. So just like vegetables, you have your warm season, you have your cool season. And for flower farmers, once a frost hits, a lot of, we, we lose a lot of our crops, just like the vegetable um, farmers do. You can have hoop houses, you can have tunnels and kind of extend the season a little bit. But for the most part, your season ends after that uh, frost. But the nice thing about the winter and the fall is that a lot of our flower farmers are going to rely on their dried flowers for that uh, time of year. And um, what's kind of cool right now is that dried flowers are actually really in. It's, it's really funny. A lot of brides are asking for dried flowers. People are really into it right now. So it feels a little bit like a flashback to the 80s, but, but it's really... <laughs> It's really great for flower farmers because that's what we we're going to rely on um, at the end of the season. So I'm just going to, um, while we talk, just kind of do a quick, easy centerpiece that you guys could think about for your Thanksgiving table with stuff you can either gather from your garden or grab from a flower, a local flower farmer. So I just have a wood box here. You can use any container that you might have handy at home. And what I put inside is some chicken wire. It's kind of hard to see on the camera. Uh, it's just a roll of chicken wire that I've placed inside that uh, container. Because obviously what's also cool about dried flowers is I don't need water. A lot of times traditionally you would put flower foam in here, which is not a very sustainable kind of product. So the chicken wire is nice because you can reuse it. You can use it over and over again. So I can put that chicken wire in as a way to hold my stems. And then what I would do is start with a good base of greenery. So this could be some evergreens that you um, grab from your garden. So I have some, um, some yew here, some taxis from my garden. And what I would do is just start adding that greenery kind of into the chicken wire. And the chicken wire then is going to hold your stems in place where you, where you put them. So I'm going to start with the base of this U to kind of go around the outside edges, kind of cover things up, and then just keep layering on. So what then, are some of the products that we're going to find at the Thanksgiving market? Will we, will we go in and find something like this that we could purchase? Yeah, I think some, I know I've seen some local flower farmers putting together kind of dried centerpieces like this that are ready to go, or they've put together um, mixed bouquets that are just grab and go that you can drop in a, um, in a vase. Um, wreaths, of course, are also really common this type of year. You might find some dried wreaths or obviously evergreens um, going into that uh, winter season as well. So what, I started, what flower are you using there? So now I'm adding just some greenery from my garden. So this is actually uh, Amsonia. Uh, thank you. I was like, it starts with an A. It's escaping me. <laughs> this is some Amsonia foliage that just had some nice yellow fall color uh, from my garden. So before the show today, I just kind of took a quick little walk about 
my uh, my beds outside and just looked for things that was going to have some color on it still and that was still holding on to its uh, foliage that wasn't going to kind of uh, drop everywhere. So I had some Amsonia. I cut a little bit of lamb's ear too. So I love the look of that fuzzy foliage in the lamb's ear. I may have to separate that out a little bit. Could you use the yellow foliage of the hostas? Oh yeah, totally. Okay. Absolutely. Because yeah, those have been knockout this year. I mean, oh, yeah. hostas have been incredible. I know. I was just, I took a picture of mine the other day because I was like, man, I always forget like what cool yeah. fall color. Because uh, you think, you just think, well, when the season's over, they're done. But man, they do get a really good glowing yellow fall color. Okay. Yeah, Kelly, good. you posted some great pics of pastas. I think it was to the horticulture group Facebook. Yeah, I just, I saw that I had to share. I wrote an yeah. article about hosta care for the winter on my blog. And it's just about, you know, getting some of the, we usually, we don't want to promote cutting back leaves, but for hostas, right. we do because we want to reduce diseases and potential problems. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. man, I was like, I need a picture of a hosta. And I was like, I couldn't have found a more beautiful picture. <laughs> I know. They're just glowing. Yeah. So I started with the base of that greenery. Like I said, it could be anything um, that you might have from your garden. Just to kind of cover things up, get a nice base. And then I'm just going to start layering in, again, kind of some flowers from uh, the garden too. So this is actually uh, sedum, autumn joy um, sedum that just dries really nicely on the plant. So I'm tucking those in at different levels. I have some uh, hydrangea, of course. You know, we're lovers of hydrangea around here. <laughs> so I have some panicle um, hydrangea to tuck in. So this, I just feel like this kind of color scheme and this vibe, of course, is kind of perfect for that fall Thanksgiving table with all of these kind of rust tones and brown tones and, and grasses. And then what you could do after Thanksgiving then is you could add some additional evergreen to this. You could add some ornaments. You could kind of zhuzh it up to give it a little bit more of a holiday um, vibe as well. So I've got sedum in there. I've got hydrangeas. And then lastly, I won't kind of go all the way. Then I would just finish it up with kind of, like I've said before, the fairy dust of the kind of more delicate thing. So I would use some northern sea oats, which is an excellent grass you can add to your garden. And that'll just kind of give it that movement and just kind of airy delicateness. You could use any, really any grass, any kind of uh, grass seed head from your garden just really adds some great um, movement in there. So yeah, so I won't go all the way, but really just have fun with it. Start a start with a good base of greenery to kind of cover your chicken wire and then just add whatever you, you like to really give it a cool textured um, look. And then, like I said, you can pull things out, swap things out for the holidays. And since it's all dried, it'll stay looking the same for ever. <laughs> really. And when you're done, you could sell it on Etsy. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That looks great. Yeah. So, so just keep an eye out for that when you do head to the, the farmer's market or the local um, grocery store, uh, keep an eye out for stuff like that, that your local flower farmers are still doing stuff this time of year. It might just look a little different than what you would get during the, the active growing season. I've actually been buying a few more flowers this year than I normally do just because they're all over the farmer's market. It's like right. anybody that uh, anybody that grows vegetables has been, you know, some of those farmers have been starting to experiment with flowers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'm starting to see more and more flowers and more mm -hmm. in different kinds, like kinds of flowers that you could never walk into a florist. And exactly. Just, you know what I mean? It, yeah. So like I saw yeah. the, the, the hairy balls, 
<laughs> you love, love hairy balls. That's a, a, a sleepiest, a milkweed uh, variety. Uh, uh, and I think that's what's cool about local flower farmers is, like you said, they're not growing that same stuff that you're going to find at maybe the everyday flower shop or at the grocery store. They're not growing carnations and roses and things like that that are very intensive. They're growing those unique annual kind of cool stuff that we can grow here in Illinois. And there's, yeah. I'm looking at the, uh, the the program preview and registration for the 2022, oh, you, it's blurred, oops, <laughs> Illinois Specialty <laughs> Crops Conference, Oh yeah. January 5th to 7th, and on the January 6th and 7th track, there is commercial indoor and outdoor flower and herb production, and there's mm-hmm. three growers mm-hmm. that are doing flowers, so yeah. it's a thing, people. It's a growing, yeah, absolutely, it's a growing, uh, growing field, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. we actually just got a horticulture, another horticulture, because Candace has been working with the cut flower growers a little bit, and mm-hmm. we just actually got another horticulture yes. educator that has some expertise in growing cut flowers, and so it's uh, really exciting to, you know, it's really exciting is that, you know, you can be a farmer um, and live off the land and, and, and grow flowers and you don't nest or, or tomatoes or, you know, you don't necessarily have to grow soybeans and corn, Mm -hmm. um, you know, as long as we're supporting them. I mean, they're never going to make any money if we don't go and buy their, their, their stuff. Yeah. And so when we think about Thanksgiving and how thankful we are, right, we're extremely thankful this year. Um, we have our families, we have our our jobs, we're, you know, it's kind of becoming a little bit more, um, you know, we're, 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 we're getting a little bit better. And now we need to thank some of the farmers that are around us. Like Nick said, there, mm-hmm. you know, we want them here. I want them here. And yeah. I'm going to keep buying and keep going, hey, I need to go to the farmer's market. Not only will I be happy because I'll have a food adventure, right? Don't you feel like it's a food it's adventure, fun. Nick? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm supporting, like, you know, Somebody that just got out of college and became wants to grow vegetables, you know, like who is that new farmer? I mean, I think more and more people are emerging like that where they want to, you know, you know, grow short term crops or um, not corn and soybeans on the land here in Illinois. We have amazing soil, right? Mm-hmm. That's an understatement if I've ever heard okay. one. And uh, <laughs> I mean, last, last night I happened to see a figure on the Moses page because I'm I'm looking at the the Midwest Organic uh, Midwest Organic Sustainable Education Service. I'll get the link. Um, I'm looking at their conference registration for this year, and uh, I'm signed up for their newsletter because of my registration last year. And last night I read their like uh, fluff posts about it, and nine percent of just Land in the Midwest uh, right now is about to go in in the next year is about to be in transition between generations. And the question is whether or not that's going to go into like get gobbled up by bigger and bigger cash grain farms, which once again, if you grow corn and soy and you're trying to make a living and your parents have done that for three generations, you know, no, uh, no disrespect to that. That's a profession right there. But um, this is a transitory time for folks like that. Moses, people coming out of school, looking for different paths, whether or not we're going to, um, like Ryan said, continue to build up our ability to produce food in the Midwest so that when stuff hits the van in the West, that we have a little bit more production power here to support more people who need, you know, local food, healthy food, et cetera. So yeah, definitely a, a important time for this conversation. So every little girl and little boy can actually say, I can grow up and be a farmer. And if we have land available and we, you know, support our local farmers, that can actually be a living where they are a farmer and grow us amazing tomatoes and basil. Mm -hmm. And then let me just put in my order right now. (laughs) Everything Kelly wants. (laughs) Because, you know, me as a gardener, I'm not perfect. I, you know, so I, I, hey, 
I tried growing some beets in the cool season this year. It did not work out. Believe me, I went to the farmer's market and bought some beets. And I've done it every week since. So, yeah, yeah. And that's where I'm at, too. I've filled all my growable space with flowers so that yeah. I can go to the farmer's market and buy my vegetables from, <laughs> from those farmers, buy them from who does it best, and, and support, them, uh, support them that way. So I just put a link in the chat to mm -hmm. the... Um, the, I don't know what the acronym ATRA stands for, but it's a sustainable agriculture organization. And the link in the chat is a, a link to an interactive map of the entire United States where folks interested in participating in a apprenticeship or internship in sustainable agriculture can click on individual farms and see live posts from mostly the posts right now are from this past year, uh, farmers looking for labor help. Um, anybody that's interested in this, this is where I found the vegetable farming apprenticeship that I participated in before my job with extension. Um, and if you monitor this page closely in the next two, two months, three months, they're going to, everybody's going to start reposting their ads for help for 2022. Um, so yeah, really cool. Um, a tool right here that, that I was able to find, um, work in and it won't pay, uh, you know, a crazy salary, but it will pay you in farming experience and it'll allow you to make mistakes on other people's farms before you start your own. <laughs> and they know that and you know that. And it's a really cool assignment. So yeah, it's true just enough. Thought, then. <laughs> just a thought if there's any, you know, 20, 30, 40 something year old person on here that doesn't know what they want to be when they grow up yet, there's an option. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, we've got about five minutes or so left. So if anybody has any final questions, we're happy to take those. But to finish this off, kind of anything we miss, like any other tips on if let's say someone is entirely new to maybe shopping local specifically for Thanksgiving, any tips, tricks, things we would uh, things that we missed that maybe we would tell tell um, them? Food co-ops may be a little bit more expensive, but they're definitely going to highlight some of those local foods. I, mm -hmm. I, I if, if it is local, you know, that is something that people are looking for. You know, you see just four people here. We, when we go shop, we're looking for local foods. They're going to advertise it. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, just look around a little bit. It, it, it can be really rewarding to shop this way. And um, yeah, you know, I, you know, I was like stunned at the different products I found. Like I found a, a flower um, at the food co-op that was produced like 15 miles away. And I'm like, really? How did I not know this? Mm -hmm. I've been surprised just at uh, regular grocery stores, and I know how you categorize those, but mm -hmm. that, that have in like these large produce sections, like some local things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I try and buy those when I'm at bigger grocery stores. And I think it, you know, if, if that's where you shop at, start to ask about that. Say, hey, do you have local produce here? And, and you know, each time you ask for that, that's demand for that larger gro grocery store to start to carry that stuff. So, even just in your your normal places you shop, look around. There's some, sometimes right there, but um, yeah, food co-ops are also a great option and also a great way to kind of connect with farm, the farming community, farmers. You know, some of the some of the turkey farms, other places. That's a great place to kind of find and connect with some of that too. So, even at my local Walmart or you know Aldi or wherever, if you look closely, you could see product of you know, the country is from or, or, or like, you know, it'll have the state if it's from the United States, even at like at Walmart, the peaches say product of, you know, Southern Illinois up until October, mm -hmm. maybe not October. I'm a little off on my peach game because we don't grow too many around here, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, it's a thing that even bigger brands are starting to respond to. And you vote with your food dollar, like mm -hmm. every transaction that you make that is in support of or not in support of, a local institution, depending once again on how we described it, which is mm -hmm. sort of vague at the beginning, but we can loosely agree Midwest and Illinois especially is good. Then, you know, vote with your food dollar. Make your voice heard. I'm telling you, I will never yeah. buy garlic from a grocery store again. Sorry <laughs> for garlic. But this farmer's market garlic is kicking butt. Mm -hmm. It is Delicious. Now, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Ryan another question. He's the vegetable gardener, right? Did anything 
from your vegetable, is anything from your vegetable garden going to make it to the Thanksgiving dinner table? Well, I guess I don't, I don't know. Um, because I, <laughs> the only thing I've committed to bring is a turkey so far. <laughs> and with my, my mom hosts Thanksgiving, we haven't decided what we'd bring, but I know this morning kind of, I admit to bring kind of a basket of stuff and I don't think not all of it was from our garden, but some of the things that I would be using are butternut squash has been super, you know, fantastically productive as a garden crop for us. And we usually have a lot we save. And I guess I was talking to my wife before I left this morning. There's a pretty funny story about the first time anybody ever gave us one of those 15, maybe even 20, probably not quite 20 years ago, but we didn't know how to peel it or what to do with it or <laughs> We ruined the squash, you know, and, and yeah. so now, I mean, we know like it's super easy to just slice that open, roast it and then scrape everything out because we, mm -hmm. were, we were trying to peel it with a little a lame, you know, vegetable peeler. So yeah. I mean, you kind of learn over the years as you start to deal with these different types of things than you have in the past, kind of how to handle them. But yeah, I think we've already talked about like kind of garlic, um, butternut squash and sweet potato are kind of the things that I think of we kind of more or less regularly grow that I'm going to put into a Thanksgiving meal, but, um, but yeah, I don't know what veggies might go yet. I haven't, haven't figured out what I'm going to bring to my mom's yet. So nice. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Anything I think is, is great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, my, my, my salon, unless I want, uh, cilantro on my Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner, I, I'm not going to grow anything for the feast. <laughs> There you go. And I'll be bringing a nice, lovely local centerpiece. I'll leave the food <laughs> to everybody else. <laughs> well, I might have to search around for that, Candace. That yeah, it's so easy. Like not. almost all those things are in my yard, too. Yeah. So you can do it. Never thought to do, that. <laughs> do it with the kids. Yeah, yeah I kids love it. Love that. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. And thanks for Nick for being our um, special guest. I think we had a lot of good combo today. Hopefully everybody's kind of inspired to head out and start shopping local for next week's Thanksgiving dinner. Um, join us again. Our next show will be in two weeks on December 1st. We're going to be switching from Thanksgiving to the holidays and talking all about holiday decor. So wreaths and everything you can do with evergreens. And then also we're going to be chatting about gifts for gardeners, any gardeners on your, on your shopping list. So join us in uh, December 1st for that. But thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving and we will, we'll see you next time. Bye everybody.